Edmund Burke once said, Nobody makes a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. Welcome to the 189th episode of Our Hen House, a place to find our way to change the world for animals. On today's episode, we talk about taptivism, the sadness and cuteness inherent in bulldog puppies, and our identity crisis. We'll also entertain you with the latest in a hopeful segment we like to call Rising Anxieties. Joining us today is Emily Deschanel, star of the hit TV show Bones, now in its ninth season on Fox. Whoa. Now that I've died and been revived and died again and been revived again and died again and been revived again, I can tell you what Emily will talk with us about today. She'll chat with us about what it's like to celebrate her 20-year veganversary, including how the world has changed since she first ditched animal products. She'll also talk about how she gets animal rights messages onto bones, how her co-workers have reacted to her veganism, and she'll even let us in on some things to explain this coming season. Ooh. Emily will walk us through a day of her favorite food and will also ruminate about fair trade chocolate, being normal, childhood memories, and honeymoons. Don't miss this interview with one of our favorite actors of all time. Uh-oh, I just died again. For our review, we are excited to welcome Bianca Phillips from Vegan Kronk, who will give us her take on the original version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. From, get this, an animal rights perspective. Yep. What? All that, vegan banter, and of course, current events from the world of animal rights. My name is Jasmine Singer, and I'll be your co-host today in our hen house, along with my resuscitator, Marianne Sullivan. Now please, pull up some hay. Let's get squawking. <laughs> I'd like to welcome my co-host, Marianne Sullivan. Hello, my little geranium. I'm a jasmine. Well, I just thought I'd branch out into a different flower since I had nothing else to call you this week. And, and I love geraniums. They're, they're always sitting on the counter ready to please, just like you. Well, um, okay, wow. By the way, I, I have to say that you do have a little garden here with jasmine and rose. If we had lots of daughters, could we name them things like... Like geranium and daisy and daffodil, we could just have a whole garden here. It does seem like the way to go, only I would be a little left out. Yeah, well, we could get your name legally changed somehow to Marigold. Hmm, maybe not. Uh, Though, you know, marigolds are pretty, I will say. And they drive away insects, which are both good features. You're I thought when you talked about our garden, you were going to start referring to our two, we have two house plants, mm. an aloe plant and a philodendron. Yeah, I actually love these plants. I, I kill things. I mean, not not animals, uh, but but plants. Oh, God, now we're going to get into sentience. But I, I do not have a green thumb. But these two plants, which you take care of, I love the way we acquired both of them. I think we've mentioned in the past that the aloe plant, I got at a free market that I went to, and someone said, if you, if you give him advice for five minutes, he will give you a little tiny stem or whatever it's called from his aloe plant. So he gave it to me in like a soy yogurt container. It was this tiny little baby. And now it's huge. It's enormous. And also we went to see a friend of ours a few years ago. And, and what was the name of the plant in the bathroom? Philodendron. Philodendron. He, that would be a bad name for our daughter, by the way. I will not name her. That. I like philodendron. For a name? Well, why not? No, I'm sorry. No, that's it. We're not having children. <laughs> anyway, our friend gave us, a leaf and now that leaf is like all over our, our 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 bathroom it's this huge plant how does this happen it's like the miracle of life yeah well that is that is how plants work which you are apparently unaware of since you have not watered them once since they entered the house i have to say and i but the thing that really made them take off we had these two plants for a while but then i bought that compost at the green market which is nice because i like to think that some of the garbage that we have donated to the green market to make compost with actually came back to our plants mm. and oh my god that stuff is unbelievable these plants are taking over the whole apartment how do you actually the the aloe one needs to be re 
repot it how, how does one do that it's getting too big for its little pot yeah i i'm scared i am totally scared i think it kind of shocks plants to repot them i'm no expert here but you know adding water and compost to plants frequently just makes them grow like crazy and they have ours i have to say vis-a-vis your story about how we got them that i would offer somebody a cutting of our plant if they promise not to give me advice what do you mean? Oh, there's nothing oh. I hate worse than advice. Yeah, but I was giving the advice. I know, and he was paying you for it. I know, but isn't that brilliant? It was me giving it. Well, are you are you saying that that only your advice is worth paying for? Well, I was sitting there in front of him talking about animal rights and how how he needs to go vegan, and you know, even though it was a soy yogurt container, it was not one of the vegan soy yogurt containers. I'm just saying. So this could be an interesting new campaign for how to make people go vegan. Go to free markets, see if someone wants free advice and get them to go vegan. I'm sure you'll convert. Yeah, we're really changing the world here. <laughs> Don't do that. I was just making a joke. So, you know what's been killing me, aside from the cronuts line in our neighborhood that is now longer than ever, and this morning I went to bring the laundry downstairs and I was outside and it was super early in the morning and the cronuts line was longer than I've ever seen it. It was like hundreds and hundreds of people in this like 17 year old girl walking around saying, do you have any questions? Like she was in Disney world. Do you have any questions? Like maybe she even sort of sounded like Minnie Mouse. Any questions about the cronuts? And cronuts, of course, as we've talked about on our podcast in the past, I'm not sure you should explain what cronuts are. There are people out there who are wondering now what are cronuts? And it's because they're not listening to every single episode. They're like a mixture of a donut and a croissant. They're everything that's wrong with the world. And the fact that this is happening in our neighborhood shows that our neighborhood is embodying everything that's wrong with the world. In other news, our apartment is not selling. I I still think we should put in the ad that it's it's right around the corner from where you can get cronuts. The cronuts phenomenon truly is just completely bizarre. And I'm glad to hear that Dunwell Donuts, which is out in Brooklyn, is now ordering offering vegan cronuts though i doubt they're getting the same line i hope they are but this has been going on for months well so has peace food cafe they also offer vegan cronuts oh i kind of didn't realize that you press on this people press it's just this guy dominique Ancelo, is this bakery around the corner from us who must be the most genius marketer in the world though i have to say if somebody had run the name cronuts beyond by me i would have said absolutely no way that's ridiculous that's the worst name you could possibly come up with what about dosants it's so much better. I don't know. How do you spell it, though? That would be the thing. How do you spell dosa? And, and then it's like not Googleable either. Anyway, I was starting to say that in addition to being completely disturbed by the Cronauts phenomenon, I'm so disturbed by these bulldog puppies that are everywhere in New York City. It's like, I guess they're trendy now. And, and we were talking about it recently. Rose finds them very inappropriate. I oh, do as well. Not. She's very nice to puppies. She's nice, but you know, in a, your inappropriate way, which is sort of how I feel. I think that they're super cute, but you and I both decided they're cute. Like all dogs are cute. Even if they're a bread dog, they're cute. But the people who have the bread dogs, they look so stupid. Like they just look like such assholes. Yeah, I wonder if this is a phenomenon that reaches beyond just us, that, that when I see people, it is true, bulldog puppies suddenly everywhere. I mean, bulldogs are one of the few breeds that has, actu- it has actually entered mainstream consciousness that there is, are serious problems here in breeding these dogs who are very physically compromised, have a very difficult time breathing. The, the mothers are unable to give birth by natural ways because the puppy's heads are too big, so they have to be born by cesarean section. Oh it's it. There's so many things that you're breeding into these animals that are going to cause them to go through just horrific suffering. It's just, I mean, it should be considered animal cruelty to breed bull, bulldog puppies. And yet, suddenly, we do seem to be seeing bulldog puppies everywhere. And yeah, I mean, I'm enticed, but they're so cute. I mean, they're puppies to begin with, and, and they're just cute, like all puppies are. And so I, I, I was trying, I, I, I try so hard not to get sucked into the, oh, how cute kind of thing. And I really never say anything positive to the people who have them. Though I don't say negative things either because I just, I can't see that being 
a, a, a good moment. I mean, after they've already gotten the puppy to tell them like what a huge mistake they've made. But yeah, the people, all the people, all people with purebred dogs, I think took, look, just look like selfish assholes to me. And I hope that's true of other people as well. They, they just look like they're completely self-indulgent and they love dogs because of something that dogs mean to them. It, it's all about them. It's not really about the dog or they wouldn't be supporting an industry that is so harmful to dogs. I, I, I just look down on such people. Well, I guess you could say to them, where did you get your dog? And they'll say, oh, this breeder out in Long Island. And then you could say, oh, Long Island has this great shelter called the blah, blah, blah or something. Bring up the conversation in a way that that would speak to them in a non-threatening way. And also, that's also a great opportunity to talk about our darling rescue dog, Rose. And whenever anyone comes up to us, we always bring that up whenever possible. No, that's a, that's a good strategy. And also you should, I mean, I shouldn't just look down on people because frequently purebred dogs may not have been gotten from breeders or from puppy mills or from pet stores. Sometimes people have rescued them. I mean, many times people have rescued them. So they, I should not be looking down on those people though. I seldom get into these conversations and I know I should more often, but do you remember that I'm the introvert? Oh, yeah. Throwing out the introvert thing in a time that will benefit you. But you're also the, you're also an activist. And I think you're underselling yourself. You do have these conversations and you are very good at them. I'll I know try. It, you do I'll try, try, but that's the I thing. I don't do it as often as I should. Well, good. So I see this as a as a promise to our many darling, adoring listeners that that you're going to more. Uh, I. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot right now. We want them to change the world for animals, so shall we? She will, damn it. I'll try. Okay, good. That's all damn we Damn it. That's all we were That's all we want. Marianne, stop taking that that vial of pills. <laughs> Come back here. We're still recording. Anti-anxiety. Anti-anxiety. I've been so anxious of late. Oh, you've been a fucking disaster. I know. It's just so annoying. I hate it when I I mean, I wake up in the morning anxious and I don't even know what it's about. It I, I don't want anybody to worry about me unduly. I always pass through these periods and they go away and then I'm regular, but well, regular means that I have a fair amount of anxiety. <laughs> regular for you is like other people's extreme stress out level oh it's just so friggin annoying really you think it's annoying that was so mean no i know we talk through it and we get you through it and it's true it's afflicting you lately you get like this in summer you get like this especially in late summer i don't know why well i think it's i mean i think it's it's always happened to me because in the job i used to have even where i work for the court the court wasn't in session in summer so there was kind of no work to do and so i used i've always had kind of a summer off kind of mentality and it's horrible because it's not like I enjoy working I'm as lazy as they come but when I don't have things on my agenda I get more nervous than when I do it takes me a long time to settle into that I don't know what's going to happen now because as you know I'm not teaching this fall I've taken the fall off and I'm going to be teaching two courses in the spring so summer is going to last for a long time but you work like 80 hour weeks for our hen house I mean it's not like you're going to be you know doing your nails and tw- you know twiddling your thumbs or anything like that yeah I know I still have work a lot but like a f- ton but, but I, I i don't know it's it's because i don't have these specific i don't know what it is why are you why are you making me explain this i don't know why i just get nervous but you've been talking lately about maybe doing more yoga yeah i'm really gonna i'm i'm going to do it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it we have talked many times on the podcast about how i um am not sufficiently physically active because i loathe physical activity of all sorts and you know, they used to make me average and now it makes me like totally not fit in. Suddenly like physical fitness has become the new heroin. No, I don't know. I have to say something that's not on our, our notes here. We, we went to see a Woody Allen movie and we never go to the, we never see Woody Allen movies because we've been boycotting him for like a decade because he slept with his daughter. Okay. It was his stepdaughter, but whatever. At what point do you look at your stepdaughter and think, sexy so we stopped seeing woody allen movies and there was this one particular day where we we've been doing a juice fast which might account for your anxiety she wasn't actually his stepdaughter they weren't married but she was for all intents and purposes his stepdaughter. okay we were doing a juice fast which might account for your anxiety and we were we, we decided to go to the movies and we wanted to see something like that was playing right then you know so we went to see blue jasmine partly because it was called jasmine and i have to say i'm back to boycotting woody allen i don't know why i stopped 
I hated this movie with everything I am. And when I saw that darling Ari Solomon wrote on his Facebook page that he loved it, I actually texted him because I felt sad that he and I were finally straying on an opinion about something. How could you love that? I I thought it wasn't funny. Like, I didn't understand it. Am I just a, a humorless vegan lesbian? Well, yeah, but that's beside the point because that movie, I'm not a humorless vegan lesbian. I'm just a, I'm a very engaging and, and humorful vegan lesbian. And I thought I hated it too. I mean, the movie made me full of anxiety. It was just, so, I mean, I don't think there were any laughs in it at all. It was a very sad story, which would be fine. I mean, it's okay to have a movie that's a sad story, but I just didn't buy any of the characters. Apparently it was a takeoff on Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, which, you know, see Streetcar Named Desire, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Don't see Blue Jasmine. Because Streetcar Named Desire is much, much better. I did not buy one character in it. Other than maybe Alec Baldwin's character, who did seem ex- like exactly who he be- would be. Uh, nobody else seemed real to me. Well, that's because he's vegan, and therefore you bought him as a character. <laughs> well, his character wasn't vegan, but he was. Did you get a load of that apartment, though, in San Francisco? The sister, who the character's name was Ginger... She was supposed to live in this like crappy, tiny apartment and she was a grocery bagger and she was a single mom of two. And it was this fabulous apartment, like fabulous. It was probably, it had a fireplace and it had a fireplace. It had bedrooms for it, the kids. It was probably, well, one bedroom it was probably about 800 square feet. It was in the heart of San Francisco. It was bigger than 800 square feet. Maybe it was bigger than that. It was so adorable. And this was supposed to be like a bad apartment. There, this is San Francisco we're talking about. There's no way in hell a normal person would be able to afford that. And I have to say that this makes me feel like rich people like Woody Allen are so out of touch with what people can afford if that was supposed to be bad. I I totally agree with you. And I don't I mean I, I saw one review, Manola Dargis's review in the Times, which which kind of made an amusing reference to that fact that Woody Allen was totally out of touch. But I find it deeply offensive that people who make movies who are so that are so wildly popular are so completely out of touch with what people make and how people live and how people struggle i don't i didn't find it a minor amusing fact at all he was very good i assume not that i really know in portraying the lives of the very wealthy and of course he is very wealthy so so that makes sense but he shouldn't pretend to know how to portray the lives of people who bag groceries she wasn't even a a cashier she wasn't even managing the grocery store she was a a bagger it was totally ridiculous i totally agree anyway that was disappointing but what was not ridiculous was the fact that you've had two major articles published recently. Oh, gosh. One, you mean one, one, one was by our hen house. I'm so excited that they, that they accepted my submission. Well, actually, it was me that accepted my submission. For my column, are you talking about that one, the Taptivism one? Yes. Both the, the column, the Taptivism column, which has really gotten an enormous amount of attention, and your article in HuffPost, which makes me cry. Oh God, it makes me cry too. Yeah, the one for tap, the one for taptivism, the one for our hen house was. I was excited to finally get a column out there. By the way, you need to write a new column. The 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 uh, your audiences are looking for your new writing. I know, I know, I know. I'm supposed to write a new column. I'm anxious. Do you get it? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Maybe you should go back to that pill bottle that you were at before. So I don't take pills. By the way, maybe, maybe we need to. I rec- do not take pills. No, you don't take pills. Not at all. Just kale juice that's your drug of choice and that's that's okay anyway i wrote an article for our column for my column for our hen house about tapativism which just talked about the the similarities between or the interconnections really between my tap dance class and my animal rights activism and it was so much fun to write it just I, I found so many similarities between like the community that you could find in both and the fact that like you really need to show up if you're going to be good at it. And the fact that like there's so much passion in it and a lot of other things too. And, and I was terrified, but I showed it to, I, I emailed it to my teacher who I adore and I'm completely petrified of. And she actually sent it around to like all these people at the, uh, in our tap class. And I was completely mortified, but it started with the fact that my shoes are the best shoes in the school. They are these fabulous silver 
like they tie kind of, they're almost like Mary Janes with a heel and they tie and they're silver. The, t- the ribbon is like a, a silver mesh ribbon. They're really cute and they're vegan, obviously. And everyone always says something to me about them. And I always say they're vegan. Literally every time I take class, someone in the school will notice them. So that was really exciting. Nothing like having the best shoes in the class. And it was a great article. I, I It was really interesting the way you, you you just stayed up late one night, which you don't do that often, and started to write. And, and appara- I don't even know when you came to bed, but it, apparently it was pretty late because it just kind of poured out of you, that article. It was interesting. Thank you. And the Huffington Post article was deeply personal. After I published it, my hands were trembling. I think they're still kind of trembling. And it was about my my dear, sweet, darling grandma, who many of you love because we've put her on the show a few times and, and about all of the struggles she's going through with her meningioma and how it's really made her completely paralyzed, almost completely paralyzed. She still has use of one hand and one arm and how she, she's so heavily doped up on narcotics that it's just really deeply affected her her life and yet when she talks and she's lucid for moments at a time she frequently frequently will talk about animal rights and animals and so I tried to capture that a little bit and and how she feels confined and she feels as though she can understand what it's like to be a confined animal because she is in a much different way a confined animal so I almost didn't know if I should publish it or not because I try and end pieces on some kind of hope and hopeful note, but this has no hopeful note. It's just, it's just fucking sad. So yeah, I apologize to everyone out there who I've made cry. I think it resonates with people mostly because we all have the experience of watching someone grow old. And this is, even though I had a sweet grandpa, he was living in Florida when he was in his last stage of life. And this is the first time I've gone through this and it's the by far the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. And, and I can't even imagine what my darling grandmother, who is my mentor and my role model and who raised me, I can't even imagine what she must be going through. So anyway, wow, I just said a lot more than I intended to. Yeah, well, it's hard not to once you get started. This is, I mean, the situation is really, it's really taken over our lives. I mean, as it should. And, and we love your grandma so much and, and what is happening to her shouldn't happen to anyone. And I know these things happen to so many people as they get old. And so, so often it's hidden out of sight and people are unaware of, of, and people don't, don't expose themselves to it. So uh, it's really, really hard to witness, but it's so important to be there with someone who's going through this. And I'm so glad that you're doing that and that you wrote this article because, because she's a fabulous person and, and she's still a fabulous person in spite of what's going on. And I'm so glad to have her wisdom shared with people. And I think she is too. She appreciates that you get her voice out. So I'm glad you do that. Okay, well, let's switch to a different subject. This is actually sort of hilarious. I have been getting a a whole slew of emails lately and Facebook messages from people. <laughs> I don't even know how to say this. From people who think that we have this file in our brains of every single thing we talked about and what episode it was on. <laughs> And what moment we talked about it. So we, I keep getting emails from people like, what was that book you referenced? It had something to do with pineapples. I think you, it might have been 2010 that you talked about it. Really? Pineapples? Okay. And people, people email and say, hey, w- what was that video? I don't know. What episode was it that you talked about... Uh, minimalism. Well, I think we've talked about minimalism on several episodes. Anyway, it's adorable. And I respond to these emails and I either say, I have no idea, or your guess is probably better than mine because I don't, half the time, I don't even know if the things I talk about in my non-recording life are the things that I actually recorded. Like I'll get confused as to whether or not I, you know, talked about making something for dinner on the podcast or actually made something for dinner. I don't know. It's just one big, one big like slide. I have no idea what I talk about what on. And, uh, yeah, I will sometimes go into the extremely excellent, by the way, search engine on our hen house and type in a word like minimalism and then bam, there's the episode for you. What do you think of this? Well, if, if you have no idea, I have less than no idea. I don't even remember what I talked about five minutes ago. I don't know where, what we talked about on this podcast episode. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I think it's we just talked about how you're feeling very calm lately and <laughs> don't try to fool me. 
I, I don't. I think it's because people just are now used to being able to access all information. So they think that we can somehow access all information because, you know, about so many things you can. Remember how it used to be where if you couldn't remember something, there, w- there was no way to find it. Like if you wanted to know who starred in some movie and you couldn't remember it, you just had to live with that or a- call people and ask them and hope that they might remember. Now you can find out everything, but yeah, we can't find out this. Or you could go. To, you could have gone to like Blockbuster Video and rented the movie or something like that. But you couldn't go onto Netflix because there was no Netflix. Or you just go. You can just Google it. I mean, you no, can. I mean, now you can just Google it. Yeah, everything is the answer. But back then, it was it was very hard to figure out. It, it's 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 totally true. It's funny because Liz, our 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 lovely, fabulous Liz, who we adore and who is responsible for getting Stevo and. And Emily Deschanel on our podcast. She's incredible. She actually was saying that we should transcribe all of our episodes. And so last week when we had Steve-O on, we, we transcribed it, the, just the interview, not the whole episode. And, and our darling Danielle, our outreach manager, who's fantastic, and it was her birthday this past week. Happy birthday, Danielle. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Danielle. Happy birthday to you. Yay. Woof. Anyway, Danielle, sweet as she is, took the first stab at it. And I think it took her something like seven hours to get a rough draft out there. Then she sends it to Liz, who works on it for two hours. Liz sends it to you. You work on it for a good three hours. You send it to me thinking it's done. Two hours later, we just had the transcript. I think it was like 12 pages long. Transcribing is hard work. Otherwise, we would transcribe all of it. I would like, however, to have some kind of an index of who was on our podcast and on what episode. I have to figure out how to make that happen. But anyway, so we also, this is the, this is the best. We sometimes get email. We, oh, I love when you guys send us emails like for rising anxieties or you post it to Facebook or you tweeted at us. That's really great. A lot of the times we hadn't read it. We hadn't heard of it. So definitely keep your ideas coming. We're happy to see them. But sometimes people will send us like emails and they'll be really frustrated about some article they saw and they say things like, we hope someone on your staff will <laughs> respond or we look forward to someone on your staff responding as if, okay, first of all, hello, my name is Jasmine. Hello, my name is Marianne. And we are the Arhen House staff. <laughs> well, that's not well, entirely true. Well, we also have Liz and Danielle. No, we have Liz and Danielle and Ben but and Cassandra. They're no, though. they're part time and they're amazing. And, and, uh, that they're incredible. So I didn't mean that, all of that, but they have, they, they are people with full-time jobs who, who do this out of the kindness of their heart. Anyway. And Rose of course works more than full-time. Well, and I guess Rose could start contacting these, these like stations and, and outlets that are, are publishing bad stories. I think that's a great idea. Rose can be very intimidating when she wants to be. Well, I don't think we should associate with her, her with intimidating because we'll start to get hate mail about that. In fact, someone's writing us a hate mail message right now. Well, then she'll just, just talk people into it with her sweetness. Well, that she can do. Anyway, I always love it when people are like, your staff, blah, blah. Should we be admitting this? Well, somebody said to us that we should, that we should give out the aura that we're much bigger than we are because because people like that so yeah i think we just shot ourselves in the foot yeah, i don't know how to handle it because like the fact is that we're in our very messy apartment right now our, our apartment it's not that messy it's messy honey i mean look around come on it's superficially messy fine it's super our superficially messy apartment which is superficially messy because nobody's buying our apartment so we don't have any <laughs> showings come down oh sweetheart come down and we are small. We're a small operation, but at the same time, we're big. We work. We 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 all work. We all work a lot, and we appreciate all of the input that all of you give us, and and all of the work that our our amazing team of writers and 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 contributors help us with. So, are we small or are we big? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I guess I'm having a little bit of an, an identity crisis in terms of this one thing. Well, I think we we need to be bigger. We are small, but we need to be bigger. And we've gotten a lot bigger than we used to be, but we need to be much bigger than we are because because there's so much more that we could do. We're already doing more than we can manage, and there's so much more that we could do. There's just so much going on with animals. I mean, it's unbelievable. There's so many people who we could have right. There's so many people we can interview. There's There's just so much that we could do if we had more staff. So I think we should transition now to a, a segment that we like to call... Rising anxieties. So this is from Ag Week, 
and it is called Culture of Beef, the answer to cultured beef. Yeah, I'm not sure this is exact. I guess it's a rising anxiety because because if there's one thing that that anxiety should be rising about in the meat industry, it's it's in vitro meat. And they got to be nervous. I mean, there's in vitro meat or or cultured meat, as they call it, and and uh, meat grown in the lab has gotten unbelievable press, as we've talked about before in the past few weeks. Uh, And. And it's it's not stopping. It's not slowing down. There's more and more articles about this. And, of course, they could, this could absolutely change the way people eat. And, and it could absolutely take down the entire animal agriculture industry if they do come up with a way to make meat by bypassing the animal or substantially bypassing the animal. I'm not sure that they will ever be able to totally bypass the animal. That's unclear to me. But so this is this... this uh, guy from the from the beef industry and talking about whether they should be nervous about this and his first thought about it is why just because we can do this sort of thing in a laboratory does that mean we should and but then he manages to go into the fact that that actually there are claims that there are substantial reasons the the main reasons are or at least as mentioned in this in this article which i think are accurate from climate change to animal welfare to the space needed to raise meat animals these are the issues the industry must take seriously because those are the issues proponents of laboratory meat give as the reasons for looking to such alternatives. Well, those are pretty big reasons for not just doing it for the hell of it. Uh, climate change, animal welfare, I, I doubt they think that's a huge issue, but, you know, some of us do. And just space, the, the amount of space we take up raising animals, not, to, not only the space that the animals take up, but the space that is taken up to grow their feed. Uh, these are enormous, enormous issues. But somebody has an answer to why, even though uh, there are these reasons, which he doesn't seem to think they're that important, that that there's another there there's something in favor of raising animals for food. And he goes on to say, but the laboratory has no history, no cowboys, no rodeo, no sail barns, no trail drives, no folk songs about riding herd cultured beef has no culture in other words so these are the reasons that we're supposed to ignore climate change animal welfare and the fact that that we're using up all available space to grow feed for animals these are the reasons it's apparently folk songs about riding herd well yeah that's much more valuable and he actually suggests this as the kind of thing that that beef producers should be pushing to to show people that meat production should stay right where it is in in based in killing animals i love this rising anxiety i love the way of looking at it this way it just helps me it's it's really helped me therapeutically i think to look at this kind of combativeness as as a form of progress well i think it's once you st- start looking at it that way it's hard not to because the stuff they're coming i mean they didn't used to write about this stuff at all they never wrote about animal welfare just not that many years ago they just ignored it and they can't anymore and you find out when they do start addressing these issues they got nothing they got folk songs they got nothing but you know what we got what emily de chanel oh man could you die? I could die. Are you dying right now? I'm totally dying. I, I died. Actually, I'm dead. Now I have come back from the dead, and I'm here to t- tell you that today on our podcast, we have the amazing Emily D. Chanel. Now, I have to say, this is so special for us because we're such, we're such ridiculous fans of her. I mean, like, we're so... We love her. We love her. We love Temperance Brennan. I totally love that show. It's one of it, it might be my favorite show on television. This is Bones, of course, we're talking about. But when you have a show that you love and the star of it just happens to be a passionate vegan of 20 years and a passionate animal rights activist, then it's like you died and went to heaven, which I did. I died. I'm in heaven. And now I would love to bring to you the fabulous Emily Chanel. But before I do, I just want to remind you that our hen house is a nonprofit organization, 501c. So we hope that you will go to ourhenhouse.org and support our hen house and keep vegan indie media alive and keep us going and keep the word out there to change the world for animals. We have amazing, amazing gifts that we offer to you just for becoming a member of the flock or for making a donation. These prizes that we offer to you start at your donation of $10. That's it, just $10, and we'll start sending you things. At the end of today's episode, we'll tell you specifically what you will get but let me and for what amount. But let me just give you a clue. You could get Vegucated, which is an amazing DVD documentary. 
by Marisa Miller Wolfson. You could get Defiant Daughters, 21 Women on Art, Animals, Activism, and the Sexual Politics of Meat, a great book. Speaking of great books, you could get the novel The Tourist Trail by John Yonker from Ashland Creek Press. You could get an Our Hen House tote bag, all ethically sourced and vegan made. You could get the brand new book Vegan for Her by Jenny Messina and J.L. Fields. Incredible life-changing book. You could get a silver and hematite necklace that says vegan on it. It's beautiful. It's a total conversation starter. And you could also dedicate a podcast episode to somebody who you love. So you could do all of that for a tax deductible donation. Go to ourhenhouse.org slash donate for more information on that and pay attention at the end of today's show because I'll tell you more about all of those goodies. But now let's talk to Emily D. Chanel, shall we? Emily D. Chanel stars on Fox's hit show Bones, a drama noted for its light comedic undertone, which will soon be filming its ninth, yes, ninth season. The darkly amusing series features Emily as Dr. Temperance Brennan, a brilliant but emotionally stunted forensic anthropologist who writes novels as a sideline and has an uncanny ability to read clues left behind in a victim's bones. Emily's performance has garnered her three Teen Choice Award nominations for Choice TV Actress Drama and two People's Choice Award nominations for Favorite TV Drama Actress, as well as a nomination for Favorite TV Crime Fighter. Emily was recently seen in Anne Renton's independent comedy, The Perfect Family, where she played a successful lawyer who struggles with telling her religious mother she is pregnant and in a loving, committed relationship with another woman. She also starred in Nick Cassavetti's My Sister's Keeper and can be seen in Jerry Bruckheimer's Glory Road. A passionate animal rights activist and longtime vegan, Emily has worked with Farm Sanctuary, the Humane Society, and Mercy for Animals. Animals. She has also been involved with Women for Women International and Five Acres. Welcome to our hen house, Emily. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here. We're so excited to talk to you. We have been fans of yours for so long, both of your acting and of your advocacy. And we're excited to talk to you a bit about both, including if and when the two overlap. So to start, you, like my partner Marianne here, have been vegan for 20 years now. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I just, I'm planning a dinner to celebrate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been vegan for 20 years um, and a bit now. Um, so it's, uh, it's exciting. I it's, can't believe it's been that long. And it's, kind of, it's the difference. Uh, as you know, is so it, it, it's huge from the time I began, and now I mean, what was available and the restaurants and food and what people knew about veganism, if anything, and now it's 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 unbelievable. It really has changed tremendously. I wish I knew the exact date I went vegan. It was so fuzzy there for a while, drifting in between, but I don't. I would have a party too. Let's but, I'll, I'll throw you a party, honey. <laughs> no. no, basically, right? How much time is yeah. there? Exactly. Champagne is definitely called for here. Vegan champagne, of course. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about when you went vegan and why. Um, I first I watched a documentary, Diet for New America, which most people, uh, or at least, I don't know, people have heard of the book. Um, or read the book, and then I read the book. Um, but there was a documentary by the same title, and um, <clears throat> it kind of opened my eyes to the cruelty in factory farms and how the food got to my plate, and uh, I didn't want to have any part of it. So I went vegetarian right away, and then um, I, it took me two years before I became vegan. Was it two? Yeah, I think it was two years. It took me a while because it was a transition to become vegetarian, and then. I, I decided to become vegan um, when I did a summer program at Bennington College. Um, that's how I remember when exactly, because it's mm-hmm. Bennington July program <laughs> in July, mm-hmm. um, which is a, a program for high school students. So I did it before my senior year of high school, high school and then um, they had vegan options at every meal. So I didn't have to require my parents to make me food or me have to try and do it while I'm also trying to be – I did plays in high school or – and I also, you know, had homework to do, so it was harder for me to cook for myself. So, um, and I didn't know what to do. So, having that one month of meals that there was always a vegan option. They had soy milk on tap. Uh, they had like tempeh and and things like that in the commissary. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was it was uh, easy for me to go vegan that way. And then I just stuck with it. I mean, I had a couple. Uh, you know, mishaps a bit, but that's basically what it became vegan. 
That's such a great story, and I love that it had to do with, well, Bennington, great old Bennington College. <laughs> what a great place that is. And, and it shows you how much the, the necessity of both the impetus and the availability. You, you were probably one of, in one of the few places in America that actually had vegan food available, and it helped you so much. And now so many pay, more people have it available to them. Exactly, exactly. I mean, this was this tiny, tiny little college that was just on it um, way back when, and it was, it was so cool. And I lived in Los Angeles growing up, and um, now you think of Los Angeles as being a place that has a lot of vegan options, but, um, and Real Food Daily open, had opened there, or it just, I think about, I, I went there once or something, um, but, you know, it's just, it, it, yeah, I don't know, I'm trying to think of when it opened, but I, can't, I went there, I think, after I became vegan, but mm-hmm. basically it opened around the same time, but there weren't any other vegan options as far as I knew. The internet wasn't really there. You didn't have that connection. You didn't have all the vegan cookbooks and all the vegan resources and nutritional uh, support and, and books on the why it's better for us nutritionally to go vegan and all that information that's come out since. Um, and all the doctors that are for it, like Dr. Furman, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's just so amazing what it's... And not to mention the shoes and... Right, the shoes. Like that. Like, I mean, you know, trying to find non-leather shoes was challenging. Shoes were definitely tough and they were pretty uncomfortable. It's still, even though things have gotten so much better and people do have the options available to them and things are changing exponentially, a lot, we see a lot of people who kind of try it on for size uh, and then, and then say that they don't feel well or they're, they're hungry all the time or they have issues. What would you be your advice to those folks? Well, just like the standard American diet or what, if you just say you're an omnivore, that can mean so many different things. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of different options to eating a vegan diet. It can be a big range. You could be eating French fries all day long and chocolate cake and you're vegan and that's not healthy. That would be healthy if you're vegan or not vegan. It's just not healthy. Um, and certain people need certain things, um, uh, differently than other people. But I, I say work with a nutritionist who is also sympathetic to being vegan because sometimes they're old school and they don't know enough about veganism. There's just a lot of information out there, but, you know, I, I say, you know, also you do it slowly. Uh, you can do it slowly over time, but, I mean, you have to also remind yourself of why you're doing it. I think if you do it for the animals, you're more likely to stick to it for a longer period of time. Sometimes I guess if people do it for their health too and they've had health issues and they've really improved, then that really makes them sick. But you have to kind of figure out what what you might not be doing that's so healthy in your diet and kind of rework that. I There was um, Bonsai Aphrodite. Do you know that yeah. blog? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I loved her piece on when she questioned becoming vegan. She had health issues for a long time and she had a long road, but she, you know, was determined to continue to be vegan and she did. And, um, it was challenging and she questioned things, but she learned how to, she figured out how to do it and stay vegan. She even has chickens and, you know, people were kind of encouraging her to eat their eggs. And she said, but if I do, that means you can't do it Mm -hmm. without being, you know, without being Mm non-vegan. She wanted to stay vegan and she did it. So, uh, I just think of that as a great example of somebody, you know, if they think they have issues or they feel like they're craving meat for some reason, I, I you know, I crave chocolate all the time. Does that mean that I should eat it? No. <laughs> well, if it's fair trade and slavery free, then Why you not? should. Yeah. I mean, yes, you should eat it, but not for every meal is what I'm saying. Well, it depends. Maybe. You have had... fair trade, of course. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, actually, you and I, we, I was just telling you this. We have a friend in common, Ari Solomon, who is a reviewer yeah. on our podcast. And I have this memory of being with him at a Whole Foods, standing in the chocolate aisle. And we were those vegans. We're standing there looking at all of the chocolate and reading the label and Google Googling whether that was fair trade and slavery free or just fair trade. And of course, obviously it had to be vegan. And we were just like a caricature of ourselves. So it's funny you should bring up the chocolate. You have to know the different brands that, that are great and their dark chocolate is vegan, like Alter Eco and, and uh, Endangered Species. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a few. It's you true. want the fair trade. I'll, that's, I'm into the Alter Eco lately. 
Okay, okay I'm going to have to try that. The well, quinoa crunch. chocolate. Yeah, I've heard about that. You, yeah. you, you've you had a number of episodes on bones that have had really strong messages about animals, like one about factory farming, which we actually reviewed for our podcast, and one about oh, the... Awesome. Yeah, well, we loved it, and one about the exotic pet trade. Now, I'm assuming that right. you were the driving force behind these episodes. Were your colleagues receptive to having bones delve into animal issues? Yeah. Okay. To answer your question, yes and no. I've, I've requested that they try to do an animal episode every season. Now we haven't achieved that every season, but, um, yes, it depends. I mean, um, Dean Lapata is one of our writers and he actually wrote the one about the chickens right, and he yes. also wrote the one, the chick, chicken factory farms. Um, and he also wrote the one about exotic animal trade. So he really has gotten into the, the animal issues, um, which is amazing. And, um, I actually, I, I talked to him one day on set, we were talking about how sugar can be processed with cattle bones. And so sugar is not always vegan. He's like, what? And I said, yeah. And I said, even water, it can be processed with cattle bones. You know, but then you have a question, do you drink the tap water, the bed? You know, you have a whole dilemma. But he said, what? I didn't know that. Oh, you just gave me a clue for something. I don't know what he's going to do with it or if it ever, ever um, came to fruition or will of this coming season. But he's really been open to um, all the, the animal issues. So he's been the man behind those episodes. And I've been um, – we just started the season. And so we haven't had a um, – I like to have a meeting with the – the producers and stuff as we start the season. We haven't had that yet, so that's one thing I like to bring up. But I really, you know, I kind of started something, but I, you know, I haven't written the episodes. And the idea that I had, I had an idea for the exotic animal trade before they did it a few years, and that totally got <laughs> scrapped, and it was like a whole new thing. And then I had an idea about, I watched some horrible show about, I, I, I will sometimes watch the reality forensic shows, which is, very disturbing, <laughs> but I will watch them. And there was one, there was one where a woman was identified because she was buried with her dog. And her wow, dog had a singular so contraption because the dog was paralyzed, and so he oh. had one of those like rolling kind of wheelchair for a dog for his oh, wow. Anyway, so she was identified with that, and I said, you know, then you could bring up dog, uh, you know, you could bring up puppy mills, you could bring up all kinds of. Uh, things with that. But anyway, I bring ideas to them, but usually it turns into something completely different by the time it's an episode. So um, Dean Lapata has been very responsible for that. But my boss is 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 um, receptive on some level, but he also completely makes fun of me for being vegan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it, I mean, you do such amazing work, though, just getting it out there to the vast mainstream is there ever any kind of backlash either through the public or through within the industry to going there um you know we haven't faced that and we've somehow been able to get away with things and you know we have obviously we have sponsors or whatever you want to call i don't think you call advertisers Mm -hmm. that sell meat um there's different restaurants that advertise on our show and um we've somehow did it in a way that no one as far as i know has actually complained about things like that but um, you know, of course, people will say crap about thing, you know, about me being vegan or vegetarian. But I don't really. I I didn't. You know, somebody mentioned that there was controversy about me being vegan while I was pregnant, but I was completely unaware because I was just unplugged to anything. Oh, well, that was good. Good, good so thinking. Crap about it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's not very. It's not always helpful to read the negative stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm. I'm really excited about this season. We are. We are serious Bones fans. We're not making that up. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. When we sit down to watch television, the first thing we say to each other is, "There are new Bones," <laughs> and then if there isn't, we find something else to watch. <laughs> I'm totally serious. But now this season, Aww. I'm totally excited okay. about this season because of the pending wedding which I hope yes. is going to occur. But now I'm even more excited because you're going to be discussing bone char <laughs> and processing and sugar. That is so yes, much bigger. Hopefully. <laughs> that could be like the exactly. name of the next season. It could be called Bones Char. We have, um, we have uh, <laughs> the wedding coming up. Palant, the serial killer, is back. The episode we start tomorrow. So that's the big thing. We go undercover. It's... Um, 
these characters that we did second season um, that were like these like kind of Italian New Jersey people, named Tony and Roxy. So we go undercover at a couple's retreat, um, a kind of a new agey kind of place uh, with a shaman. We do a sweat lodge, which I, ha- which I have personal experience with in my real life from when I was young. But um, so, yeah, so we, that's fun. We go undercover very conspicuously, as always on Bones, when we go undercover. It's always the most conspicuous. I can't wait. We're not trying to blend it at all. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's fun. We have a lot of fun episodes coming up, and there might even be um, a honeymoon after the wedding. I heard a rumor of that, so that would be fun too. This is exciting. We got married last year, so oh, congratulations! We live it. (laughs) Did you get a honeymoon? Uh, we went to Chinatown that day. <laughs> we had some very good vegan lunch. I had a, I had a two day honeymoon that was just a surprise to me. So uh, I, I hear you on that. Oh, well, you're ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's exciting. So two, one two days. We heard my that, parents never had a honeymoon, and they've been married for like forty years or something at this point. Yeah, um, we should. Years. We'll go on a honeymoon with your parents. That's that's how we'll oh, yeah. That's we'll arrange that. It'll be fine. <laughs> so uh, I heard that you just did a PSA for Mercy for Animals that is coming out. Yeah. Soon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's um it's basically um opening people's eyes to what's going on in factory farms and uh, the cruelty and encouraging people to get involved by changing the way they eat and also supporting organizations like Mercy for Animals. So Mm -hmm. shedding the light on um, the abuses. So, you know, I did... um, I did the voiceover for something that was specific for Mercy for Animals a couple years ago that was for... um, or a year ago, I guess, for... um, uh, auctions specifically, mm-hmm. and I've done this year. I did something for PETA that was about dairy specifically. So this one's a little more inclusive of a lot of different things that happen, and kind of just it shows people some, you know, some images and and things that are happening in um, factory farms, and kind of opens people's eyes to what's happening and the cruelty that that happens to these animals before they land on people's plates and. And and it's just also talking about the great work that Mercy for Animals does, um, which I love, and mm-hmm. I love that. I love Nathan, who runs it. He started when he was a teenager, just so inspiring. Um, so and now Ari works there, so that's very exciting. Yeah, <laughs> we love Mercy for Animals and Nathan and Ari, and it's it's great that you did that. Ari said it was fantastic. I can't wait to see it. Now I have to say, you just radiate health and beauty I, I mean I'm not going to get into oh, the crush I have on you because that would be inappropriate <laughs> for this interview but I know that our, our listeners are probably curious and so are we could you walk us through a typical day of what your life looks like in terms of food yeah food okay um, I, I right now I have food delivered but it's generally um, you know for breakfast it will be um, veggies kind of like a hash, um, and sometimes I have hot sauce because I look a little spice sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I'll make a shake for myself in the morning um, if I want a little extra boost, like w- with some protein powder, and I, I, I'll use Vega protein powder, or I'll use Warrior Sun Warrior, mm-hmm. um, or use this other pea protein powder, and I mix them up, and then I'll um, even do some berries and coconut water and and put in some greens and things like that. So, um, uh, and I like this NutraVeg um, supplement. Um, mm-hmm. That's just an oil. It's like an oil. It's like you know, it's omega threes. Uh-huh. Okay. So um, it's like fish oil for yeah. vegans. <laughs> right, fishless oil for, from algae, right? Fish approved yeah. algae. Thank you. I was like plant. Got it. Plankton. <laughs> <laughs> Plankton. Uh, algae. Thank you. It's from algae. So I like that nutri veg. Um, but um, I have a salad for lunch every day um, with some kind of um, protein, which is usually beans or nuts or seeds um, added to it with a dressing. And I I have snacks, but I'd like to have a little treat. So I'll have a little tiny cookie or some, some fruit. So I have something sweet. I have a sweet tooth, so for dinner, veggies with, like, a tomato sauce and some daya cheese, or it could be, um, you know, a big heap of greens with, you know, different sauces and things. 
I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I don't have time to cook for myself right now, so I'm not cooking, but um, I love, like, sesame sauce that, that I can, that's very simple to make with just lemon juice and sesame seeds. That's what I'd make sometimes on my own. I'd make some kale or spinach and and mix that in with it. Um, Where were we before kale, you know? Like, why did we oh, not grow up on kale? It just sort of appeared lately, or at least time. I know. <laughs> And now it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. So it's hard to avoid now. But, yeah, I um, I try to, you know, make sure I get my greens in with a raw salad and cooked greens, and I can uh, as much as possible. And try to drink, you know, green juices every day or every other day. You know, I'll put some green powder in, in water and or lemon in water to kind of alkalize things. I, I can see why you look so so healthy because your diet sounds incredibly healthy. And it's interesting, isn't it, how vegan food has kind of shifted away from a lot of the soy products. And, and you've been vegan a long time uh, and, and, and drifted more towards the vegetables. Vegetables are kind of at the center of everybody's plate. Yeah. Now everyone, the new buzzword is plant-based food. Right. You know, you don't hear vegan as such as plant-based food plant-based diet, which I like. I mean, it should be plant-based, and you should be as close to the source of the food as possible. So, yeah, I don't eat a lot of the fake meat. I think that's a good transition food for people who are still are moving from becoming, you know, for moving into veganism or vegetarianism, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't know how healthy it is to continue eating. I, I can't have soy anymore, so that limits a lot of things, but... Yeah, I think that a lot of people find that they they move toward vegetables. But, you know, whatever people want to eat, it's fine as long as they don't eat animals. There you go. (laughs) So do you feel like the Hollywood scene is becoming more vegan-friendly? Yeah, definitely. I mean, more and more people are becoming vegan, and people are more aware. Uh, I don't know. I think just in general in the world, I'm not really in a Hollywood scene, so I don't know. But I just know in the world it's become more vegan-friendly. Before, when I have to explain what it is, they, you know, now people know exactly what it is, and they're already sensitive to that, and <laughs> yeah. so it's it's nice. I'm really glad that we're living in the times that we are, and I can imagine it's only getting going to get better and better. But like people like Bill Clinton, when people like Bill Clinton are vegan, I think that also makes it. I don't know. It normalizes more it a okay little bit, right? Some people, yeah, it normalizes it. Yeah, yeah, oh, it must make sense. He's doing it. Right. Bill Clinton is doing it. No, um, it's true. It's everywhere. And you have a brand new baby. Congratulations. Thank so you. I would imagine that that would be a very hopeful thing for you as a new mom to be raising a kid in a world that seems to be bending toward compassion a little more each day and bending toward more consciousness and certainly more vegan Yeah, food. it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I mean, one thing my husband worried about raising a vegan vegetarian child is, you know, him feeling different. But then talking to other parents of kids who are vegan or vegetarian, it's it's much more normal these days. I remember as a child, this is horrible, but I remember as a child, my sister had a girl at her birthday party once, and we had hot dogs at her birthday party, and the little girl said, I'm a vegetarian, I can't eat this. And I remember rolling my eyes and thinking, oh, <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> That's good. It's good to remember things like that. We all have stories like that where we thought it was radical or scary or weird or gross. And it, it helps just you annoying. It was weird and annoying to me as a child. Like, it didn't affect me at all. I wasn't even making the hot dogs. I didn't have to make her some other food. And <laughs> it was like, just like you're weird or something, you know, yeah. you're other then. Mm-hmm. And that's not okay with me. Um, yeah. But I just, I always laugh thinking about that because, you know, now, having a kid who doesn't eat meat, it's, you know, yeah, he, he may experience people thinking that about it. Surround him with a lot of really weird kids, and then he won't be weird at all. That's my parenting advice. Exactly. <laughs> I like it. I yeah, like it. yeah. See? The weird kids are the more interesting ones anyway. Exactly. They grow up to change the world. So, Emily, I can't thank you enough for joining us. You are doing so much to change the world for animals. And like I said, we're, we're big fans of all that you do for the world and all that you do, you know, for our entertainment hour at night. <laughs> and I just <laughs> really, I'm, I'm so grateful that there are ambassadors like you out there fighting the good fight and speaking the truth because people listen to you. And I, I, I appreciate your sharing your story <laughs> with us on our hen house today. Such a treat for us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You ladies so much for all that you do for animals. You do incredible work. And I really 
appreciate it. It's a lot more than what I do. So I'm very happy to be on your show and um, talk to you. Yeah. Well, thanks, Emily. Uh, talk to you soon, maybe next time over a quinoa, chocolate, fair trade, slavery free street. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye. bye. That was the one and only Emily D. Chanel. And now let's get right into some news, shall we? Let's begin with some excellent news today. I love this. Foie gras maker drops, quote, humane label after false advertising lawsuit. This one is from Tree Hugger. Yeah, and of course, if you've been listening to the podcast, you are familiar with this lawsuit brought by ALDF, Animal Legal Defense Fund, as well as Ellen M. Kova of The Regal Vegan, the maker of the only humane pate, the wonderful foie gras, and, and they sued Hudson Valley foie gras, the evil Hudson Valley foie gras, the arch nemesis of so many animal rights activists who, who not only actively participate in the force feeding of ducks for the production of their fatty livers, but were claiming that it, their, their product was quote unquote humane. And they sued them for false advertising. The real question in this case was whether they were going to be able to get into court. And we've discussed in, in prior episodes that they were successful in getting standing to bring this lawsuit. And standing, of course, is the legal term that means that you're the person who's allowed into court to make this argument. And apparently that was all it took once they, Hudson Valley found out that they were going to get into court and they were going to have to actually fight this on the merits. They caved and they agreed to take that word humane off of their label. Yes. And so that is a major victory. So exciting. From the Humane Society, shareholders to Tyson Foods disclose risks associated with lagging behind on animal welfare. Yeah, an interesting approach from HSUS and a few other groups, uh, Green Century Capital Management, which, which is a socially responsible investment firm, and the United Methodist Church Benefit Board brought this shareholder petition to Tyson because they are all shareholders in Tyson, and that, that's an important thing for animal protection groups to do, to buy shares in these companies so that they can bring petitions like this, saying to the management, well, you better disclose to everybody and to all of your shareholders all of the financial risks that you're causing them because of the fact that you are not keeping up with, with consumer demand because you are doing absolutely nothing to phase out gestation crates. And uh, this is a great approach. It's just one more way to drive these people crazy. And, of course, as we've said before, gestation crates are a tiny victory but a huge victory because it would be great to get pigs out of gestation crates, but it would be even greater to get them out of slaughter completely. But other companies have made some small motions toward uh, getting gestation crates out of their supply line, and such as Smithfield and Hormel, small as that is. So Tyson really is, from the point of view of its share shareholders lagging behind. And with all of the large pork buyers, such as McDonald's, Burger King, Costco, Oscar Mayer, and many more, demanding gestation crate-free pork, that is a, a, a risk to their shareholders that Tyson is not keeping up. So just another approach to hopefully putting a thorn in the side of, of some of these animal abusers. So the next story that we have is called Breed-Specific Legislation is a Bad Idea. Well, yeah, we've been saying that forever, but you know who's saying it now? This story comes to you from the White House. Yeah, exactly. This is a response on We the People, the White House's uh, petition site in, in which people are allowed to bring petitions. And they responded to a petition that sought to ban and outlaw breed-specific legislation. And they, they responded that, yeah, they think... That they didn't exactly say that there should be a federal law, which would be pretty surprising. It's hard to imagine that that they would go that far. But they are saying that they think breed-specific legislation is a terrible idea. And they, they cite the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which looked at 20 years of data about dog bites and human fatalities and found that, that breed-specific legislation was really not the way to go and that it's, it's impossible to calculate bite rates for specific breeds. And that, that there have to be much better ways to approach dog bite problems. And so it's kind of cool that the White House actually responded to this petition, which did not reach the 100,000 level where they've committed to respond, but they responded anyway. And yeah, they, they don't like breed-specific legislation. Even though the president has gotten a second purebred dog, yeah. 
Yeah, but we don't know yet whether he rescued, whether it was from a rescue or from a breeder. I doubt it was from a rescue. And then they kind of made a, a contribution to the Washington Humane Society at the same time, I guess, to placate the animal rights community. They got a second Portuguese water dog. I have to say, she is awfully cute. I'm sure that she would be cuter if she were ethical. Well, I'm sure she's ethical. That's true. She's ethical. That brings up the whole problem we were talking about earlier about the dogs are so cute. It's just the people who look like assholes. So the, Not that I'm calling the president an asshole. Though you kind of are calling him saying he looks like one, which is not exactly calling him one. It's like when I was a kid and I would say, Mom, you're acting like such a bitch. And she'd say, don't call me a bitch. And I'd say, I didn't call you a bitch. I said you were acting like a bitch. Oh, good one. Why didn't you become a lawyer? (laughs) Anyway, big thank you to Violet Michaels for sending that to us. (laughs) From Animal Defenders International, El Salvador votes to ban wild animals in circuses. Yeah, Latin America is is just going gangbusters on this issue. El Salvador, just the latest country to ban wild animals, not all animals, but wild animals in circuses, and they are joining Bolivia, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Paraguay, and Peru. And they've all introduced nationwide prohibitions. This is great news, and it just shows you that, you know, once one country does it, other countries kind of get on the bandwagon when it's such an obvious positive thing to do. Uh, good, good work by Animal Defenders International. From the Irrawaddy, covering Burma and Southeast Asia, destined for slaughter, 120 dogs find safe haven near Rangoon. Yeah, this may not be exactly news, I don't know, but I just love this story. It's out of Burma, and, and it, it talks about this rescue of, of these dogs who were destined for, for the dog meat trade in China. Dog meat is apparently not a thing in Burma. It is in China. And and the Burmese, a number of these Burmese rescuers were very angry that these dogs were being exported to China to be killed and eaten. And really just a wonderful story. I encourage anybody to read it about about uh, this particular rescuer and and how how hard she works and, and how she is. It took her 26 days to bring the dogs all down to Rangoon and a lot of them are in very tough shape. Several have died since the rescue, but she's gotten a lot of support and there's mention in, in this article that there's a growing animal rights community there in Burma, which is just so wonderful to hear. Lots of good news today. I like we, that. We have friends all over the world. We do. We do. I feel like we're going to start singing Kumbaya now. This is a, a, a lovely news, news segment today. Well, yeah, I guess there was a lot of good news there. I just want to remind you that if you're interested in reading these stories for yourself, if you go to Our Hen House, on the top of the page you'll find a breaking news ticker and the stories that we went over today flash across the screen. There's a pause button, by the way. Read the story about Burma. It's so touching and wonderful. And also, if you want, there's a, a link on the blog entry that corresponds with today's podcast episode that will take you to a list of our archived news items. Also, remember some of the news items we post to our website, they don't make it onto the podcast news, so it's worth checking out and bookmarking ourhenhouse.org. And that was our news. So a few weeks ago, we talked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and how it is one of the most important vegetarian films in history. And we asked you, our listeners, if anybody would be able to review this, since we're a little bit too much of a baby to do so ourselves. We heard from many of you, and we just jumped on the first one who contacted us, and we're thrilled that that person was Bianca Phillips of Vegan Crunk. So I'm just so excited to welcome to our hen house Bianca Phillips, who's going to give us her thoughts on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original one, and why this is a pro-veganism animal rights film. I'm dying to know. Welcome to our hen house, Bianca. Hello. I'm so excited that you are you were the very first person to write back to us and say that you would be happy to review the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is just terrifying to me to even think about but also thrilling i'm glad that you're doing it and not me ever since we talked about it on our podcast a few weeks ago we thought well gosh if this has to do with veganism or animal rights at all even if it's just loosely connected we have to go there you are a brave soul had you seen the texas chainsaw massacre before you wrote to us Um, actually i hadn't seen the original i saw the um newer version in 3d earlier this year um but i was scared of horror films yeah, I was scared of horror films growing up, so I am trying to kind of go back in my adulthood and watch 
the original things again. So this seems like a great opportunity to watch it from an animal rights perspective. So I didn't know it had an animal rights theme either. So I don't so. have any idea how old you are, but I'm looking at your picture and you're really cute. And you pro- you look like you're probably <laughs> around my age. So did you grow up on like Jason and Freddie? Yeah, yeah, Jason and Freddie were definitely like, you know, the B horror guys when I was a kid, but I was scared of them. I would not watch those films. Oh. So. Wow. But now I'm going back and watching those things, and it, you know that they're not nearly as scary now. <laughs> I watched them. I, I remember sneaking in. Well, sneaking in. I was like maybe in fourth grade or something like that, and I would never do it now. Ever. I, I also used to ride roller coasters. I don't know what what like what changed, but I I'm I'm impressed that you that you have the ability to do this now. So tell me what you thought like what is the the i didn't even know there had been a remake of the texas chainsaw massacre but the original one that you are covering today this is from what year it's from 1974 and it was directed by toby hooper it stars marilyn burns paul a partain edwin neal and gunner hansen who plays leatherface okay i have no idea who any of those people are marianne do you know i don't either i think no. many of them you know i don't know if they went on to have bigger careers but i've not heard of any of them before <laughs> How can you get a bigger career than the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? That's, that's, Maybe they all died. Point. Maybe they were all killed at the conclusion. Yeah, of the film. It's, it's kind of creepy like that, but what has happened? Okay, so I have no idea what the plot of this film even is. So enlighten me. Okay, well, um, it starts out um, August eighteenth, nineteen seventy-three. Is everything happens on this one day, and there's five teenagers: Sally, her brother Franklin. Her boyfriend, Jerry, and their friends, Kirk and Pam, who appear to be also dating. Um, and they're just off for a summer drive in their van. And they're going to go explore the old Franklin house, which is like this old abandoned house that used to be in Sally's family. You know, no one lives there, and it's just creepy. So they're off to explore this house. And almost immediately, probably in the first 10 minutes of the film, uh, you get this sort of animal rights message at you. And it's subtle throughout the film, but there are also very obvious moments where you're like, how can this be about anything else? But it actually, you know, I think from a mainstream perspective, I don't think most people know it's about animal rights, but I think it really is. Um, And you see this very early on. I can't even picture how anything you've described would point remotely to animal rights themes. (laughs) Okay, well, it starts, you know, within the first 10 minutes, Suddenly, someone says, like, what's it smell? Ew. And everyone, like, wrinkles their noses up. And they slam the window shut in the van. And Franklin, the brother of Sally, says, hey, that's the old slaughterhouse. Hmm. And then he goes into this horrifying monologue about how cows are slaughtered at the slaughterhouse. And he goes into, like, the old method and the new method. And the old method talks about, you know, they used to hit him in the head with a sledgehammer. And they wouldn't die immediately. They would twitch and they would have to keep hitting them again. And... And he talks about, you know, sometimes they would skin them alive before they were, you know, they were, thought they were dead and they weren't dead. And so while he's describing these things, it's showing scenes from the slaughterhouse. You see, you know, what? cows that are dying and drool coming out of their mouths. Oh and Wow. So it's, it's pretty in your face right there in the beginning. And Why did I not know finishes, this? Yeah, it's really, you know, I don't think that people really, mainstream people know that this is about this. But I don't see how you could watch it and not get get an animal rights message from it. Isn't it always um, like that when we're watching films that have loose loose ties to animal rights issues and we're like, oh my god, it's just as important as an MFA video, and then the next guy's watching it and they're like, what are you talking about? This is like about, you know, murder and, and blood and gore. Exactly! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, after Franklin finishes describing the slaughter methods, one of the girls in the van says, people shouldn't kill animals for food. Wow. And it's like, Right there, <laughs> you know, it's like in your face. That's crazy. But do they? Yeah. Then, so what happens on this ill-fated trip? Do they then all get killed? <laughs> they well, um, I don't want to give away the ending. Yeah, but, I guess um, you shouldn't. But many of them do get killed. That's I mean, you can go ahead and assume that. But they they pick up a crazy hitchhiker mother on the road, and it turns out this guy he he's kind of loony, and you know you know immediately this guy's not right. But he. Um, says that he used to work at the slaughterhouse. His family has always worked at the slaughterhouse. And he even says, my family has always been in meat. And that's kind of foreshadowing for what's to come. Because later, these teenagers find themselves at the slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse is down the street from the Franklin house. 
Um, and they kind of like stumble onto this property. And one by one, they go into this house and uh, they don't come out alive. <laughs> but the first guy, Kirk, goes into the house. And uh, Leatherface, who's the killer in the in the film, he's Leatherface. Kind of big... Wow. He's yeah. Like... See, I would probably opt for like polyurethane face or pleatherface. <laughs> yes. Well, it's funny. It's Leatherface. It's not funny. It's horrifying. But Leatherface uh, wears a mask made of human skin. Oh my god. And I think that that's a message right there in itself. Like you know, the human skin is no different than the animal skin. But he comes out of a of a room with a sledgehammer and hits Kirk over the head. And it plays out just like Franklin describes in the beginning, that, um, you know, Kirk doesn't die immediately. He twitches, and um, they have to keep, the other face has to keep hitting him over the head with the sledgehammer uh, until he finally is dead. Shortly after, his girlfriend Pam goes looking for him, and she's strung up on a meat hook. So the ways that they die are, you know, they, he uses slaughterhouse equipment to kill them, so... Wow, how does this even happen without this being the emblem? I guess this shouldn't be the emblem film of the animal rights movement. That would be totally creepy and weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, Peter did say it was one of the top ten movies that would make people meatless. So it's definitely, I mean, I, I guess people just you know don't know that it's got this, this message, but it's it's there, and it, it's pretty obvious. There's actually a scene where um, it shows a room that's full of feathers and human bones and animal bones all mixed together. And there's a chicken in a cage, a live chicken, and the chicken is, like, squealing and, and very upset. And it kind of it makes you think that maybe this is, you know, how the chicken feel in battery cages. They're in these rooms full of death and decay, you know? So when you saw the, the remake in 3D, I have no idea what drugs you were on when you decided to do that. But when you saw the remake in 3D, did you then realize that this was similar to something that we might be... You know, advocating. You know, it's it's not this. The animal rights scenes in that film are not quite as obvious. There is a um, a scene toward the end where they go to an old slaughterhouse, and that's where um, I can't remember exactly who, but there are some people that are killed with mm-hmm. the slaughterhouse equipment there. But it's not a theme throughout the movie like it is with this older version. Mm-hmm. Um, and the remake is not. It isn't exactly like a remake of the original plot. It's more like a sequel, actually. Um, it happens, you know, in the in the, in the now, in the 2000s. Uh-huh. But yeah, I was drunk there with some friends who wanted to watch it, and I... Yeah, and you're like, oh, yeah. God, well... I was like, okay. <laughs> it was actually really cheesy. This original film, I think, you know, is, is done in a way, it's very artsy. The 2013 or 2012, whenever it came out, that one is it's very cheesy, so... Well, at least it's soy cheese. Soy cheese. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really bad soy joke. cheesy. <laughs> so, I saw... On Wiki, I have the Wiki page open right now for the original film, that Hooper actually produced the film for less than $300,000. And the cast that he used was all unknown actors who were mainly from Central Texas, where the film was shot. So that's funny. He he couldn't even find a distributor. And and finally he was able to after a really long time. But that's that's interesting. It seems like this was like the little horror movie that could. Yeah, and it's, it's you can tell it's cheaply made. But I think that kind of adds to sort of the art quality also since it was filmed in the 70s it has that like old look to it you know the old film and yeah they, i guess that explains why we've never heard of these actors before because they probably did that film and that maybe that was it yeah <laughs> jody foster turned yeah. it down i guess are there ways to use this film i mean this film is really a classic of a genre that is so po- wildly popular do you think there are ways to use it as an activism tool i i can't imagine getting me to see it but <laughs> but then i'm already vegan so who cares like who, who would you say would be the target audience for this? Uh, well, actually, uh, PETA, on their list of top ten movies to make you go meatless, they also say this is one of the top vegetarian films to show on campuses, the college campuses. Ah. So um, that might be a good way to get this in. And I think what's great about this film is that it's not marketed as an animal rights film, and it's you know it's a classic horror film that everyone knows of. So I think it's a good way to get people in to watch the movie. And then these, you know, animal rights themes are all there, just kind of planting seeds, which is great. I can almost see afterwards just maybe hosting some kind of a accidental vegan film festival or something, or maybe not even, maybe uh-huh. not be that outright about it. And then hand out some footage of undercover work in factory farms and say, here's the real horror, you know, and then obviously f- feed people little cupcakes with, 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 
chainsaws <laughs> in them or something like that. I could see a I whole event here. We want to, Marianne and I want to have some kind of a, a playlist on our, uh, on our iPod that is accidental activist songs. Cause we keep hearing them, you know, like I shall be released is an accidental activist song, or maybe that one wasn't actually that accidental, but well, there's animal active. That one's an accidental animal activist song. Yeah. Well, true. <laughs> so there's also so many songs in show tunes. Th- this seems like we could have a whole list of accidental vegan making movies, and and there, this could be one of them. This is really cool. So, would you recommend this film to people like us who don't really watch horror movies? You know, it's not that scary, and it isn't even terribly gory. You know, the, to me, the most disturbing scene in the whole movie was when it showed the the cows in the slaughterhouse. I mean, yeah. and I watched this alone at night a few nights ago, and I was not afraid to go to bed. <laughs> so that's a good sign, I think, that it's not terribly scary. I think it's scarier if you're like a, a little kid. I guess it came out before I was born, but had I watched this as a kid, I definitely would have been horrified. But I think you guys can watch this and be fine. So were, were chainsaws actually involved? There were. Um, several of the, of the victims were killed with a chainsaw. Um, Kirk, after he was hit over the head with a sledgehammer, was um, cut up with a chainsaw in front of Pam while she was hanging on the meat hook. Um, yeah, this doesn't later sound scary film, at all. Yeah, no, just another day in the park. Yeah. <laughs> I guess killer films don't freak me out as much as, like, goat films. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. But, I can see that. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that it, later later in the movie, um, Sally, who is the, kind of the heroine of the film, she tries to get away, um, and they catch her, and they tie her up. And she passes out. When she comes back to, she's at the dinner table with the Sawyer family, which is Leatherface and his brother, the hitchhiker, um, and then the dad. And they're all eating these huge plates of meat. And there are these pig squealing sounds in the background. You never see a pig, but there are pigs squealing. And you are kind of, from what's happened throughout the film to that point, you kind of get the idea that that meat is made of humans. It's made of her friends. Mm. So I think that that also kind of helps kind of steal that that theme that we're no different than the animals wow. which is kind of the theme of that movie that's powerful. That's some. Yeah. I remember a few months ago on the podcast, I was, Marianne had no idea what I was talking about, but I was mentioning how when I was a kid, there was that whole Bloody Mary thing where you couldn't say Bloody Mary a certain amount of times in the mirror in the dark or like this ghost Bloody Mary would come out. And it was the scariest, like it was absolutely terrifying. She would come out of the mirror and, and all of these people, you know, in their 30s, emailed me and said yeah that was me too that happened to me too i remember that i felt so i felt so validated in my childhood <laughs> terror of you know of bloody mary so i still will not stand in front of a mirror and say bloody mary with the lights off see i never have done it and i won't do it because exactly. i don't want to know what's going to happen i know it's true exactly well i don't know what you guys are talking about it's just scary <laughs> just don't you don't want to know it's it's terrifying Bianca, thank you so much. Before we before we conclude, I just want to ask you, t- tell us a little bit about Vegan Crunk. Sure. Um, it's a blog that I started in 2007, and I blog daily um, recipes or reviews of cookbooks, vegan products. Um, and it's, I'm, you know, I live in Memphis. I grew up in Arkansas, so I try to focus a lot on, um, like, southern food, like soul food, but veganized. Mm. Um and I have a cookbook that came out last year called Cook and Crunk, which is, um, came out of the blog, but it's um, just vegan soul food. So, Eating vegan in the dirty south. I love that. So do you have a favorite southern soul food dish that you have veganized? Yeah. Oh, in the book, the, my favorite thing that I, that I have in there is my country fried tempeh steak. It's like a double breaded fried hunk of marinated tempeh, and then it's slathered in like soy milk gravy so it's it's oh pretty good God. and decadent <laughs> that sounds like it sounds like we have yet another reason to go visit memphis that's you were saying before we started recording that memphis has quite a vegan scene it does i mean it's just developed in the past couple of years we have a you know four vegan restaurants here and we have we just started a vegan drinks chapter we had our first meeting last month and we had like 25 people show up which was crazy for wow. for memphis and um yeah, yeah we've had a pretty good vegan senior. That's great. So cool. Well, we have to get over there and 
I am just really, really excited that you're out there. We need more people talking about animal rights and veganism, and you are doing that and creating delicious food along the way. So I'm really grateful to you for, for, for being out there and also for reaching out to us and saying that you will watch this scary movie for us so that we don't have to. So <laughs> I'll watch scary movies for you anytime. Okay, well, anytime you're watching a movie and you're like, there's an animal rights theme, then you know our number. Let us know, and we'll have you back on to talk about it if we are so lucky, and hopefully none of us will get eaten by Bloody Mary before then. <laughs> it actually wasn't That's eaten. So it was, like, just murdered. Awful. Ugh, awful stuff. Yeah. Bianca, thank you so much for joining us today in our hen house. We so appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks again, Bianca. And thank you for listening to the 189th episode of Our Hen House. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we are listener and reader supported. If you're listening to this, that means you. But don't go yet because we have some fabulous gifts for you as our, as our thank you for supporting us. If you go to ourhenhouse.org then you can make a donation of any amount you are able to. That would help us tremendously to get the word out there. So let me first tell you about what it means to become a member of the flock. You could become a member of the flock for a recurring monthly donation of $10 or more per month or a one-time donation of $100 or more. Well, that will get you a membership for a solid year. So go to ourhenhouse.org slash donate and please make a donation of any amount you're able to. Let me tell you what you get for becoming a member of the flock. You get access to exclusive interviews and contests and giveaways and discount codes and inside scoop and recipes and tips from experts and lots of other goodies too. But you'll also get a copy of the award-winning documentary Vegucated by Marisa Miller Wolfson and you'll get a copy of the book Defiant Daughters, 21 Women on Art, Animals, Activism and the Sexual Politics of Meat, which is a wonderful anthology that I'm very lucky to be a contributor for. So I hope that you'll read that and enjoy it, watch the DVD, enjoy that. And thank you for for your donation and your flock membership. So exciting. If you want, you can make a donation of $25. This is perfect for people who are already flock members who might just want to make another donation. Why not? Or maybe it's because you want a copy of The Tourist Trail by John Yunker, which is an amazing novel that Ashland Creek Press published. I love this book. I will say it again. It is my favorite novel, and it has strong animal rights messages throughout it. It's just amazing to read a book that you could actually identify with. For a $50 donation, we will send you... Oh my God, this is incredible, you guys. We will send you a copy of Vegan for Her by J.L. Fields and Virginia Messina. And we we love JL and Jenny, but we also love this book. This is perfect for you. And we'll also send you an Our Hen House tote bag. So you get both the book and the bag for a $50 donation to Our Hen House. For a $75 donation, we'll send you a silver and hematite necklace that says vegan on it. It's beautiful, and it is a conversation starter for sure. So definitely go to ourhenhouse.org slash donate. You could also dedicate a podcast episode. Remember last week's dedication? It was so sweet. For a hundred and fifty dollars that you could you could dedicate a podcast episode to somebody you love and we will read that dedication on the air and you will know that you're helping to create vegan indie media by doing that. So our henhouse.org slash donate and we look forward to that. Thank you. We also look forward to seeing you on Facebook, Facebook.com slash our henhouse and on Twitter. We're at, at our henhouse. We're also on at our henhouse on Instagram. So find us there, please. Go to our online magazine. Have you done it yet today? Go to our online magazine. Read some of these articles that we publish daily. Daily. Every day. Well, not Sunday. But Sunday doesn't really count. Does it? No. So go to Our Hen House's online magazine at ourhenhouse.org. We have features. We have columns. We have reviews. We have blog entries. We have amazing articles up there just, just waiting to be read. And they all speak to the idea of changing the world for animals. So I'm, I'm excited about our online magazine. I, I really... I'm so thrilled about some of the pieces we've had recently by guest re- reviewers and, and by guest feature article writers. It's, it's great. We have a This Animal on This Day section. I hope you're listening because I want your photo of an animal on this day. So send us your photo. If you go to the sidebar on ourhenhouse.org, you could upload a photo of an animal in your life or an animal who you love or an animal you passed on the street, whatever, an animal, and send us one sentence about him or her, as well as where the photo was taken. And, and that photo will appear on our website on ourhenhouse.org in the near future. 
just for doing that. It's such a great little aspect of our hen house. Don't forget about the breaking news ticker on the top of the screen. It pauses. There's a little pause button. I love that little pause button. And it is going to allow you to read some of the articles that we talked about today on our on our show in our news section. It will also allow you to read some other articles that we didn't talk about necessarily that are up there. And it will also allow you to find a link to our archived news items if you want to thumb through some recent pieces that we've had featured on our podcast. So that's our breaking news ticker. And if you want to contact us, there's a contact button at the top. That will let you decide who you want to write to and you could write to us or you could just email us directly at info at ourhenhouse.org. It lands right in our inbox and we look forward to hearing from you. Oh, oh, and if you're listening to this on iTunes, leave us a friendly review. Do us a solid. Leave us five stars, would ya? Thanks. We really appreciate it. We really do. Because the more that you review our Hen House's podcast on iTunes, the more out there it is and the more people will learn about it because it'll be more featured by the iTunes gods and goddesses and then they will feel inspired to change the world for animals. So thanks for that. I appreciate it very much. And I think that's just about it. Oh, we have an Etsy page, etsy.com slash shop slash our Hen House. And we just have a good old time. We have a really good time. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to you. You really give me hope and inspiration. My name is Jasmine Singer, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.